Hello and welcome to Take a Wonder with Shapes. My guest for this episode is CEO of Helping Rhinos, Simon Jones. Simon, welcome to the show. It's great to have you on. How are you? And where in the world are you at the moment? Thanks for having me on on, on your podcast. Um, so I'm in the UK at the moment, which is where we are based. Um, we only got some teams around the world, but I'm based here in the UK. Um, but I've actually just got back from visiting some of our projects in South Africa. We'll come on to some of your projects shortly. But before I get on to that, I always like to introduce our guest. So in your own words... Just explain a little bit about Simon Jones. I'm the founder and CEO of Helping Rhinos, um, which is an international NGO. And as the name implies, um, is working to try and protect rhinos uh, in their natural habitat and also protecting their habitat so they can can thrive for generations to come. The project itself and the charity, I've been looking into it. It's a fantastic project, but we're going to get you to discuss a little bit about what you've been up to, how you've got to the stage. Before Helping Rhinos, became a charity what was your background in and how did you actually fall into the charity and why as well background actually was not in conservation at all um i I was actually working in the corporate world i worked for american express for 24 years um but was kind of beginning to transition from corporate to conservation um, doing little bits of conservation work here in the uk um and in 2010 i'd spent six weeks on a a game reserve called Karika Game Reserve in the Eastern Cape of South Africa. Um, and then in 2012, they had a particularly bad poaching incident where three rhinos were poached uh, in one night. Uh, one of them was dead um, when we found them in the morning. Uh, two were still alive. Uh, one of those, the bull, um, who we named Timber, He survived actually for 24 days before he succumbed to his injuries. Uh, and the other female who survived and and i will talk about her in a bit called tatty so that it was that poaching incident and i think the fact that i was in this transitional period from corporate to conservation there was an emotional link to where this poaching had happened i'd actually been there and seen these rhinos you know two years previously um so it was that kind of final nail nail if you like that made me say right okay now's the time we have to do something can't just sit back and do nothing anymore we have to do something to try and stop this um this sort of wave of poaching which was going through the continent um and and so that was really how helping rhinos got got started um that was in march 2012 just just quickly go back whilst you were working in the corporate corporate world you had an interest with rhinos or did you have interest in conservation in general with animals and did that interest then lead to you going on a, on a trip and then yeah what so, you did? so it was an interest sort of um wildlife conservation africa particularly um and that led me to doing some conservation work here in the uk actually um with big cats in a breeding center here in the uk Um, I'd gone out and done, as I said, a six week um, conservation program at the Cricket Game Reserve uh, in 2010. Um, And so I was already kind of like wanting to do stuff as well. Rhinos always was the animal I kind of wanted to see when when going to Africa for for reasons I always struggle to articulate. Um, And and then it was a case of, you know, when this poaching happened and it was in a place where I'd spent six weeks driving around, I'd seen rhino calves being born there, you know, Uh, and and it was a so right okay you know I, I just that at that point the fact it was rhinos i was looking to actually move to do more conservation work with what we call in situ conservation which is animals in their natural habitat uh, and it just kind of came together really sort of my experience of, of being involved in you know business development project management um, more laterally having experience in the charitable sector just everything sort of came together and said right you know i think i can actually make a difference by by you know doing setting up helping rhinos and and it started really just as a one-man band you know 11 years ago uh and and has gone on you know gone on from there um so it really was that sort of that emotional link to where this poaching happened that you know you can sit here look at the images on online and you know talk about how terrible it is but but suddenly there was a little bit more than that because you know i could picture the exact spot where these rhinos have been poached be driven around it for six weeks you know so so it was that it was that final final kick if you like when you are in a corporate world and it's a secure environment secure job benefits to it the risks that you would take to to set up a charity 
did you calculate that and did you feel it was that it was absolutely necessary to to leave that well behind and and start this project it's a good question and and lots of people have asked me that over the years and you know people said oh you were very brave to give up a, a corporate life and a corporate salary to to do this it didn't really feel like it at the time um it just felt like it was something that ha- i had to do um a- yes of course there was lots of discussions uh, with my family around what you know what the implications were what it means um i guess i was fortunate to a certain extent that i managed to to leave under a redundancy package so i had a, a little bit of a payout and that allowed me to well actually it allowed me to to initially plan to work in the charity for free full time for 6 months that ended up being for 2 years um as we built the you know built the charity up um so was it a risk yes it was um you know, I still, you know, even now, probably, you know, in, my income is 20% of, of what it was when I was in a corporate world. Um, so, yes, it, it was a risk. It definitely meant some sort of some lifestyle changes, of course. Um, but it just seemed like you know, I had to do something, you know, you couldn't sit back on sit back and look at that and and see what was happening to, to rhinos, you know, around the world and particularly across Africa and think, you know, just sit back and say it's terrible and then get on with your day-to-day life you know I felt there was just uh, I suppose a greater calling of of making a making a difference and 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 I'd like to think we have made made a difference um, over the last 11 years. You said before you've already kind of said that you you struggle to articulate but why rhinos for you there are other animals as well who are in in endangered species but why particularly rhinos for you and, and you're right I, I do struggle to articulate it and have done for the last 11 years if i'm honest um but but you know and i suppose uh, before i answer it try and answer it a little bit bit more fully um you know we're called helping rhinos our focus is around rhinos but it's important to to remember that you know we're protecting rhinos because they are probably you know the most threatened species from poaching and have been over the last 10 years so by creating an environment that that protects rhinos we are protecting all of the other wildlife that share their habitat you know lions elephants um you know everything else that that that, that, that we could mention that you see you know on those on the, the the traditional sort of african attenborough programs you know i struggle to articulate i think it's something about I, I definitely have this sort of affinity to to large animals that can do you serious damage if you're in the wrong place <laughs> with them you know at the wrong time um I remember the first time I ever went to to Africa just as a tourist, you know, the guide sort of says to you, what do you what do you want to see? You know, and I remember saying rhinos was the the first thing that came out of my head. I remember actually doing a photography course here in the UK um, at a wildlife park long before I even started helping rhinos. And, you know, the idea was to go and practice your photography skills and round and take all these animals. I remember spending the whole afternoon just in a rhino house, you know, taking pictures of rhinos. So. So that doesn't really articulate why it's rhinos. I, it's just something inside somehow that they they there's that sort of connection there. I think it's you know they've been around since the dinosaurs. They're huge, they're they're majestic animals, but yet they're really gentle giants as well. You know, if you can you look into the the eye of a rhino, you can really sort of feel its soul. And I think that there's that that sort of connection. I think um, uh, and and they were one of the most you know threatened species threatened with extinction in our lifetime because of what was happening, not through any sort of natural event, but by human activities in poaching was, was threatening to wipe these animals out um, off, from, our, from our world when they've been around for, you know, tens of millions of years. And, and yet in our lifetime, we're, we're at the risk of, of wiping them out. And that just can't happen. I know what you're talking about. When I was in Zimbabwe about six, seven years ago, that, well, we were on a not conservation, but we were sort of looking out for all the big fires, really. And yeah. rhinos is one of them. And rhino was actually one of the hardest. They were the hardest to to spot because they were so little. And I remember whilst I was in Zimbabwe, there were guards, and they, they actually said to us, "If they see someone that they don't recognise, it's shoot first, ask questions later." Because of the fact that there's been so much poaching mm-hmm. and for people who don't know that they've been poached for the horns and then the horns are being sold in the black market. Yeah. And, and I was actually quite fortunate recently when I was in Nepal, it's not quite Africa, but there were rhinos that I saw in, in 
the Chitwan National Park. And yeah. I'm quite 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 fortunate. I saw about twelve in total. I was able to get very close to close to them. Yeah, and that would be the greater the greater one horned rhinos or, or the Indian rhinos that you would they have were seen there. The, yeah, that's correct. That, that's yeah. absolutely correct. And they were very different to the ones I'd seen in Africa. Yeah, they are beautiful beautiful creatures, very peaceful. And there was I remember the the guides making specific noises to make sure that we weren't a threat, especially when we were in Africa. I remember we were walking up to it and the rhinos were getting up, but the, the guides were making some specific noises to sort of say it's okay, no danger, we're able to sit, and it, it was amazing. I, I absolutely understand your passion for trying to protect and preserve and, and keep the, the, the lives for the next 100 years or next 10 million years. Obvious question is what makes you different to other charities who are very similar to yours you know there are a number of wildlife conservation charities out there um obviously you know we are while well, focused on rhinos and where rhinos are as i mentioned before you know but, but at the same time protecting all of the habitat and all of the wildlife that's there as well um i mean we work in a in a model that's you know we form partnerships with our project teams on the ground um, and we kind of work very much as a as a sort of global team ethic towards that. So we're not just a grant giving organization. Obviously, you know, that providing the funding is what as an international NGO what we do, but it's very much looking at how do we work with where we believe are key areas to protect rhinos and what we are call what we call rhino strongholds. Um, and how do we we work with teams on the ground, with teams internationally. You know, rather than working in isolation, everybody and everybody trying to do everything, let's let's form a, an effective environment where we're maximizing the very limited resources, whether that's human resources or financial resources that goes into protecting these animals and, and how do we maximize um, those limited resources. So so that's that's kind of our goal. We have uh, three key areas that we we focus on. I mentioned rhino strongholds that within our rhino strongholds program, we have three key elements of that. So looking at the three big key threats to rhinos, which is really um, looking at poaching, which we've mentioned briefly, um, you know, is a big threat for the horn, which as you rightly say is is just keratin. It's just compressed hair, the same as our hair and our fingernails. Uh, and you know, that's sold on the black market. And for the last 15 years, that's been the biggest threat to rhinos. Um, it continues to be a threat after the lockdowns. We're seeing uh, more of a uh, more of a, a rise again in poaching. And it was a bit of a lull when it was difficult to move any any sort of something like a rhino horn illegally across international borders when they were closed. Um, but you know, it's not just poaching. There's loss of habitat. That's you know, we've got lots of degraded land that you know we need to look at how we can rewild and restore that land for for uh, for wildlife generally. And obviously, we're focused on areas where we want to reintroduce rhinos um, to. And then you know, the third threat is is what we refer to as disengaged communities. Um, so you know, for for many many years, wildlife and conservation and the local communities that that live around those areas where where rhinos um, are still uh, have it, still uh, are living, you know, they've not been engaged in conservation. In fact, it's almost been a threat to them because you know you've got sort of all these tourists coming in and spending lots of money in the wildlife parks, and none of that's feeding through to the local communities. So. So we need to work out how do we engage those communities and, and bring them into the wildlife conservation fold because ultimately that's that's where our, our long term success is going to lie, um, and you know and that's becoming more of an issue now because the human population is is growing as we all know so that's putting a bigger threat on on our protected wild spaces. So so they're the three key areas that we focus on. So it's poaching, it's loss of habitat, it's disengaged communities, um, and then we have a sole suite, series of suite of projects that sit underneath those that addresses those three areas, um, all under our heading of creating rhino strongholds, which is what we are, you know, our long-term vision is having areas where rhinos can, uh, and all wildlife can actually, you know, roam freely, um, relatively free of the, the various threats that there are today and and have a future and, a you know, a secure future on our planet. I've seen it firsthand on what, can, what happens. Now, Trying to convince, as you mentioned, they're getting grants mm. for people to donate. What, what are the challenges you, you face when it comes to that? 
I mean, there's a number of challenges. Um, you know, so as I said, we you know we are we're headquartered in the UK um, with our project teams on the ground. So, you know, there, there aren't rhinos occurring naturally in the UK. Um, we we do have offices in the US and we have offices in the Netherlands as well. There aren't rhinos in the US or, or the Netherlands. So we are trying to engage with people um, with something that's not on their doorstep. Um, and and that's one of our biggest challenges is is helping people to understand um, the impact of actually losing rhinos, whether it's in Africa or the Asian species of rhinos, has a huge impact. Even if you're sitting in the UK or the US, you know the rhinos are what we call an eco engineer. Um, so they are creating an environment that allows um, this natural world to thrive. And and as we know, the threat to the natural world is one of the biggest impacts of climate change you know we are seeing around the world you know increased extreme weather conditions floodings fire flooding fires um you know that is driven by ultimately through the change in our climate and the warming of the planet you know and the warming of the planet is because we're destroying natural spaces so by creating natural spaces that allows rhinos and other you know uh, mega herbivores to thrive uh, and we are actually doing a, our part to impact the negative element of climate change. And that, that is having a direct impact on us here. You know, here in the UK, we were one of the coldest winters winters on, on, on history. You know, even even in South Africa, we're in Eastern Cape, where Tandy, the rhino I mentioned earlier, is, you know, they're just coming out of a seven year drought um you know those you know where those sort of so so there's impact of all of those extreme weather conditions is having is having on all of our lives and everyone around the planet and it's one of our biggest challenges is is helping people who are not already passionate about rhinos or african wildlife understand the importance of protecting those wild spaces around the world uh, and and the impact that will have on our own lives, no matter where in the world we live, if we don't do that. You have a big event every September as well, where it's it's held in London, I believe, is that correct? And yeah. you invite all sorts of people from all over. The event that you hold, why is that very significant every single year? It's significant for, for a number of reasons. So you're right, um, this year on the 30th of September, which is a Saturday, is our global gala for rhinos. Um, it's held at the Royal Geographical Society in London, which um, is uh, on Exhibition Road uh, next to the Royal Albert Hall. Um, but we also stream live around the world. So the reason we're doing it on a Saturday, we, we have a reception from five o'clock. Our main event starts at six o'clock um, is because no matter where in the world, perhaps perhaps not Australia, but uh, it's fairly a convenient time, no matter where you are kind of in the world, um, to tune in. Um, so, so they, and we've been running these events for six, six years now, um, and they grow every year, which is fantastic. Uh, and for us, there's two, two main elements of this. Um, it is a fundraiser event. So we do have an auction that we run, both a silent auction that runs in the lead up to the event. Uh, and then we have a, a live auction on the night itself. Um, so the it's a, it's one of our biggest fundraiser events, and it helps us to um, to to do what we do on the ground. But but equally important is actually having people come along and hear from some of the speakers that we have this year. We have um, we're actually being hosted by um, the actor people may know from Downton Abbey, um, Peter Egan. So he is hosting our event um, this year. He's just actually been out with me in, in South Africa um, just last week. Uh, we have speakers, uh, Megan McCubbin, who people might know if if, uh, from the, if you're in the UK from likes of Springwatch. Um, Giles Clark, who's also um, a TV presenter and conservationist as well. So they're coming to talk to us around different elements of wildlife and rhino conservation and how the work of helping rhinos is, is making a difference there. Um, and we also have um talks from a couple of people from the field um that we're working through from south africa from kenya who are actually giving us a, a hands-on on the ground perspective of day-to-day -day life so uh, yes you know it's a fundraiser event and it's very important to us from that perspective but it's also important that it helps us spread the word 
uh, around not just our work that's being done on the ground, but generally why it's so important that we protect rhinos and 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 conservation generally and their habitats and, and everything everything else that goes with that. Sounds like you've built momentum by getting people involved from the the acting world. And that's a that's obviously going to be good for for the long run because it builds that brand awareness i know you said it's a, it's a fundraising event and you, you, it's very important to the long cause but you mentioned that you've got teams around the world but how small is your team and how big would you like it to get to with events like in september okay so our team is as helping runners is a relatively small team i mean we're a we're a registered charity and i think it's important that you know we don't most of the money that, that we raise it goes back out into the you know, to rhinos um, around the world and and their protection and, and and everything that we're doing in terms of that conservation space. So, so we have a relatively small team here, um, uh, but uh, you know, my our wider team um, includes our, our projects on the ground as well, um, and we've kept those deliberately small. We have seven projects that we work with, and and again, um, because of the element of how we work in a partnership, I think. You know, we we embed ourselves. I go and visit the project, some of the team here, you know, so we really get a feel of what's going on and we can talk with credibility to to anyone, you know, any of our supporters because we've been there, we've felt it. You know, I was just at our Rhino Orphanage facility and the, the day that a new orphan came in. So, you know, that's that's important that we we have, we can, you know, we can talk to people around not just a theory, but actually living it. Um, so we work because of that element of it. We've got a number of projects that we think are making a difference long term to, to rhino conservation. And we're choosing to go down that road. I believe that's the right approach. So, so less is more to a certain extent. All of that said, as we grow, you know, we do have a long term vision that will expand beyond the current areas that we work with. But uh, but that will only happen as our resource levels grow and we're able to to play a significant part. So, you know, the goal of helping rhinos really is that, you know, who we work with, we want to be a significant um, partner in that work, you know, in terms of the funding that we're able to provide rather than just, uh, you know, a one-off grant that, that's helpful of a, at a one-off time, but actually longevity of what we're trying to achieve is important. So that the longevity, longevity of the relationships is important. Most of my audience will be travellers from all, all around the world. So mm -hmm. we talk about backpackers to people who do luxury. If someone was to get in contact with you, can they actually volunteer with with the project? Can they go out to Africa and help out the help out helping rhinos? Absolutely. So, so a lot of the projects that we run have um, volunteer programs. Um, so, um, so for example, you know, our Pejito in Kenya is one of our partners. You can go and volunteer there. You can volunteer at our uh, rhino orphanage, which is the Zululand Rhino Orphanage. Um, so you can go and volunteer there and it you know and it involves a, a whole when you go and volunteer these it's a whole variety of, of level of work you know it's hands-on but it's also out in the community it's also looking at you know alien plantation and vegetation control um so yes yeah, so i mentioned old pedrita and the rhino orphanage Krika foundation you can also go and volunteer at as well um which is the reserve where, where tandy was uh was poached so um and actually even the, the black mambas we haven't mentioned yet but the black mambas is the first all-female anti-poaching unit so there is a volunteer program linked to to them as well obviously we're not going to send you out on patrol um with uh with the black mambas you know doing fence patrols but there is things you can get involved in like you know sweeping for snares and things like that so um um snares are sort of metal um metal rings if you like that get set by poachers not necessarily for rhinos a lot of it push meat poaching but you know that can escalate to rhino poaching so these are traps set out in the field to capture animals and it causes a very slow and painful death so it's important we, we always are sweeping areas to remove these snares so there are a number of different areas um, and projects that people can can volunteer at and, and if anyone is interested then just i uh, Come on to the Helping Rhinos website, click on the contact us, send us an email, and we will we'll talk to you around what, what works best for you and put you in contact with the, the right the right guys on the ground. Where would you say you'd like to be in a couple of years' time? What what is your your main motivation and well for helping rhinos? We need to continue to do what we're doing. We need to continue to to get on top of the the 
poaching crisis and and do what we can and use new you know implement new technology so we're trialing new technology we have an eyes in the sky program that, that is you know running with you know not just now planes but drones and state-of-the-art drones and um, thermal imaging cameras to help identify poaching we're using new technology to try and get one step ahead of the poaching syndicates um, so I think we need to continue that journey um, in establishing that and, and always looking at new new ways of of protecting our wildlife um, and I think you know so I think over the next one to three years that's that's what helping minders wants to do you know let's let's expand the influence that we're having and the impact that we're having in the areas we're currently working over the next sort of five to ten years we definitely want to take our rhino strongholds model which you know by then will be a not just a you know a, a concept that we've been rolling out for the last couple of years but actually you know a really proven methodology to rhino conservation that we can take out to other areas you know you mentioned you've been in zimbabwe earlier so you know that's not necessarily that's not an area we're working with at the moment but i the, the longer term vision is to how do we take this concept that's proven and roll it out into other areas and that will take obviously more significant funding to be able to do that and then our long long term vision is actually how do we take that and and you know, you mentioned the greater one-horned rhinos that you saw at Chitwan National Park in, in Nepal. You know, how do we take this to the Asian species and say, no, we've proved this works in Africa and now let us prove that it works here in Asia as well. That was actually one of the questions I was going to ask you, moving it from Africa and then taking it to other parts of the world. That's I'm assuming the big goal for you eventually as, as time that the next 10 to 20 years, which is why events that you hold in September are vital to your cause and the bigger the, the the, the team could become the bigger the project, the bigger the company becomes, the bigger the charity becomes, the more you can help out, help out right now. And I'm just going to finish off with one last question. Why is animal conservation in general really important? Because I had a guest on a few years ago and didn't actually believe in animal conservation because he felt as though they should be left in the wild, free as they should be. And I've had arguments to say, no, well, it's required because it it helps protect the protect the animals for you. How would you answer that question? Okay, so I would answer it two ways. So, so in an ideal world, your previous guest was absolutely right. We would let animals, you know, roam across our planet, and and we would leave, leave them be, and they would survive, and they didn't need any any human contact. You know, if if it wasn't for the impact of the human race, the planet, the wildlife would take care of itself. Um, but we living, that's not the reality of, of how we're living on, on this planet right now. You know, the human population growth is, is extreme. Um, that puts more and more threat onto our natural um, resources, our natural wildlife, our, our, the wild spaces. Uh, and a lot of our wildlife is at threat now at, at a much greater rate. Uh, threat of extinction, a much greater rate, you know, even from when the dinosaurs were going extinct. Um, so you know we we are causing this. It's not all natural. You know, if this if it was just a natural cycle of events, your previous your previous guest would would have a valid point. But it isn't a natural cycle of events. It is mostly driven by human activity, um, and and therefore we have an obligation to protect you know, the, the, the the very things that we are putting at threat by the way that we're living on this planet. And and if we don't do that. We will. The human race will wipe itself out. You know, we can't continue to grow and, you know, and, and take over the planet and 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 not change the way that we we're living and we're protecting those natural resources, as I mentioned earlier. You know, whether even even in Africa and the, the wild spaces around the world, you know, we, we hear lots about the rainforest. You know, even the oceans as well. You know, we have to protect these this natural environment because if we don't, the planet will become inhab inhabitable. In um, inhabitable to to us as a human population, and therefore it, we do have an obligation because we are driving a lot of the damage that's being done. And and to give you a very specific example, the, the northern white rhino um, is a subspecies of the the African white rhino. Um, it is endemic to Central Africa, um, and it has been wiped out to the extent that there are now just two individuals uh, known to, on, left on the planet, and they're actually at our partner in Kenya, Old Pejeta Conservancy. Um, it's a mother and daughter. They can't breed naturally. So we're now using science to try and recreate the northern white rhino through through embryos created in labs that, that go into 
southern white rhinos as, as surrogate mums. You know, so lots of people are saying, you know, that's really taking conservation too far and it's too much intervention. But actually, they have only been wiped out because it's very difficult to run conservation projects in Central Africa because of the, the difficulties with various civil wars and such like there. Um, so they've been poached to complete or to functional extinction now. So for me, there's a if you didn't have conservation projects to protect our wildlife, protect our natural spaces, there's a very real example of what will happen. You know, we will wipe things out if we don't have protection measures in place. So I believe it's imperative that we have uh, work going being done to protect these areas and 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 actually you know look at how do we have the human race and our wildlife living harmoniously side by side um you know and that doesn't mean lying down next to a lion or a rhino at night of course it means how do we how do we live you know how do we both benefit from the the increasingly limited uh, wild spaces that's there um, and and we we have uh, because they are under threat from our actions. That's our obligation to try and protect that. Um, and we can all play a part in that. You know, you, you know. Obviously, a lot of your you know, your your viewers here will are often you know are travelers, as you as you mentioned. You know, going on safari. Every time you go on safari, you'll be paying um, a, a conservation levy when you go in, into wildlife. So so you know to so, so go on safari. You'll have a great time, but you'll also be contributing to the protection of the areas where you're visiting as well. I mean, it's a fantastic charity that you run. I'm pleased that you've come on the show to discuss it and. Hopefully people listening will be able to get involved. And before I let you go, how can people get involved and where can people find you? The best place to go is on our website, which is helpingrhinos.org. Um, on there, you'll find links to buy tickets um, to the Global Gala for Rhinos um, on the 30th of September. Um, and many other, other events that we're running through the year, um, you're able to find out much more about our work there. Um, get in contact with us. Um, you can make donations via our website, of course, um, and support the work that we do. So, yeah, so really it's to visit helpingrhinos.org. Simon, thank you so much for coming. I really appreciate your time. Hope to see you very soon and take care of yourself. Thanks, Ed. Nice to, thanks for having me. Don't forget to subscribe to my channel and hit the bell button to never miss an episode and watch all my previous episodes from the show. You can also follow me on all my social media platforms. That's it for Take a Wonder Chefs. Hope to see you all soon. Until next time, bye for now.